Welcome to another video from BunMed. Today we will be focusing on another important topic in haematology, which is the pathology of lymphoma. We will also briefly be covering the anatomy and physiology of the lymphatic system. So to start off with, let's think about what lymphoma actually is. And in simple terms, it's defined as a cancer affecting the lymphatic system. Now, primarily, this affects the lymph nodes, and any area or any lymph node in the body can be affected. However, typically, it affects the armpit, the neck, and the groin. And so these are important areas to examine when approaching a patient. It's also important to remember that there are a number of other organs affected um, in lymphoma and also play a part in the lymphatic system. These include the spleen, which is an important organ for the emergency supply of red blood cells and platelets and can be used by the body, for example, if the patient has severe bleeding. Additionally, another important organ to consider is the thymus, and this is a butterfly-shaped gland important for the maturation of T cells. Now, when it comes to the roles of the lymphatic system in the body, there are a couple of important things to think about. The first one is that the lymphatic system plays a very important role in fighting infection and it contains a number of white blood cells, for example these plasma cells, to help fight pathogens. Additionally, it's important for the regulation of fluid. Now in our body, of course, we have cells that require nutrients such as glucose and oxygen and for those nutrients to get from the, uh, blood, from the blood into the, 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 the cells, uh, they will essentially need a mode of transport, which is known as the interstitial fluid. So this interstitial fluid uh, will move from the arteries and will bathe those cells with nutrients, and then it can be reabsorbed back into the arterial system. Now, the majority of it will be reabsorbed into the arterial system. However, some of it will still remain around the cells. And it's important that the lymphatic system is able to uh, mop up that extra fluid um, otherwise, it can build up and lead to edema. The third point links to the second point about fluid regulation that I've mentioned, and that is maintaining osmotic and hydrostatic pressures. Now, uh, here we have a diagrammatic representation of a capillary. So on the left hand side, you have the arterial side of the capillary, and then on the right hand side, we have the venous aspect. So if we think about the arteries themselves, um, I'm sure you're aware that the pressures in the arterial uh, system are very high. And so if we do have fluid in the arterial side of the capillary, it will get pushed out. And this is known as the hydrostatic pressure. As we move towards the venous aspect, the hydrostatic pressure will begin to reduce. And this is because of friction and other forces that are playing a role. Now, when it comes to the uh, venous end, we have osmotic pressure, and this is the pressure that's produced due to the presence of proteins such as albumin within the capillaries. And so these will help to move that fluid back into the, uh, to, into the capillary. Finally, we have the importance of transporting lipids from the intestinal system uh, into the blood which can then be used by the body. Now, when these lipids are uh, within the, the lymph, lymphatic system or within lymph, then this fluid is known as chyle. Okay, so let's have a look at the anatomy of the lymphatic system in more detail. So as I've mentioned, there are a number of organs that, that um, play a role within the lymphatic system, and these include the tonsils, thymus, and spleen. And in terms of lymph itself, it's passively pumped around the body. So rather than something primarily pushing lymph around the body, there are actually three key things that help the lymph to, uh, to, to be pushed around the body. The first one is the arteries. So the arteries are in close proximity to um, the lymph, the lymphatic circulation. And therefore, when the arteries um, pulsate, they will produce a pressure and that pressure will help the lymph to move around uh, the body. The second reason is because of muscle contraction. 
So when the muscles contract, this will again cause the lymph um, to move around where it needs to. And there is also a third reason which, will we, which we will have a look at in the next slide. So let's start off by looking at the basis of the lymphatic circulation. And it all starts off with the lymph capillaries. Now the lymph capillaries are the um, starting point and they will essentially uh, collect the lymph and they have valves in order to prevent the leakage of lymph flowing back. Just the same, the collecting vessels will then, uh, the, the lymph uh, capillaries will then drain into the collecting vessels and again, these have valves in order to prevent backflow of lymph. These collecting vessels will then drain into the lymph nodes, which will drain into the lymphatic trunks and then into the lymphatic ducts. Now, two important examples to remember is the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic. The majority, around 75% of lymph, uh, is drains into the, th the thoracic duct and the rest drains into the right lymphatic. So the right upper half of the body is drained by the right lymphatic and the rest, including the left upper half and the right and lower, uh, and the right and left lower um, parts of the body are all drained by the thoracic duct. Finally, the ducts will then drain into the vein and enter the systemic circulation. And in this case, the examples to think about are the jugular and the subclavian. And if you think about the location of these veins, you'll notice that they're actually both located um, in the upper half of the body. And why might this be? Pause the video and have a think about this and I will continue with the presentation. Okay, so the reason is the pressures. So of course, in the upper half of the body, we have the lungs and the lungs produce a negative pressure. And this negative pressure helps lymph to flow into the vein. Uh, and of course, this is important because lymph is not actively pumped around the body. Okay, so now let's start by categorizing lymphoma as I find this is quite useful when it comes to thinking about what type of lymphoma a patient might have. And there are three ways, three main ways that you might be able to um, categorize lymphoma. The first one, which you probably might be aware of, is Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. We can then also categorize them by the cell type affected. So is it a B cell lymphoma or a T cell lymphoma? And finally, we can categorize them depending on severity. So is it a high grade lymphoma or a low grade? And this might be important when it comes to treating a patient and choosing options for that. Okay, so now let's start by having a look at an example case. So a 23 year old male enters your clinic complaining of a lump on the right side of his neck. He also has a cough and has noticed some difficulty breathing. On palpation, the lump is rubbery and non-tender he also has had a fever that has been cyclically rising and falling for the past two weeks. On further questioning, he is noted to have weight loss of 10 kilograms over the past month with some night sweats. So the question here is, what is the key information that needs to be taken from the history? Again, if you'd like to pause the video and have a think, feel free to do so and I will continue the video. So here I have highlighted uh, the key details that I feel uh, are important to pick up on. So first of all, this is a young male who's complaining of a lump and he describes it as rubbery and non-tender. We're already thinking at this point that this is potentially uh, concerning. He's also had a fever that has been rising and falling, which is a very unusual or interesting presentation. And then we have this patient who's complaining of uh, quite a lot of weight loss and he also has some night sweats. So we do some further investigation and basic bloods show, uh, sorry, that should say hemoglobin of 100, platelets 298, white cell 1.3 and an MCV of 93. And as you can see, I've highlighted the um, abnormal pathology here. So this patient has anemia, as you can see, 
and he also has a low white cell count. So we decide to do uh, more investigations and we do a biopsy of the lump to see what might be going on. And on biopsy, this is a histology slide showing these cells. Okay, so hopefully uh, by now you are thinking that this could potentially be, or is most likely, a diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now Hodgkin's lymphoma is a cancer that typically affects either the younger patients or the older patients. So in our example, this patient was 23 years old, and so he fits um, into the younger population age group. In either case, it's more common in males, and it's also noted to be associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, Epstein-Barr virus is an interesting virus that in itself may cause um, lymph lymphadenopathy and also hepatosplenomegaly. So it's an important differential in this case. Of course, it's also important to think about a family history um, and if this might be present in this patient. Now, when it comes to the symptoms of the cancer, uh, we can see that this patient had quite a lot of these. So first of all, he told us that he, well, oh, oh, on examination, we found that this patient had painless rubbery lymphadenopathy. And this already raises red flags because typically benign things such as an infection might be painful, or if it's something like a lipoma, this will be fluctuant in nature as opposed to rubbery. And so this is an important um, finding. Now when it comes to Hodgkin's lymphoma, a key that typically can can you might see in, in exam situations is that the patient has a painful lymphadenopathy when they're drinking alcohol. So as highlighted in red, uh, this might be something that you see in an exam. Additionally, if the mediastinal lymph nodes are affected, then the patient may also have shortness of breath and coughing. And then we have something uh, which we term B symptoms. And again, this is something uh, seen in lymphomas. So it includes things like a fever over 38 degrees. If the patient has had weight loss of greater than 10% of their normal weight within six months. And also if they have night sweats. So again, these are red flags to think about. And of course, in this scenario, the patient did mention he's had a fever, but he said it's been rising and falling. And this is something known as a Pell Epstein fever. And it's something that you might see in Hodgkin's lymphoma. The other time to think about when a patient might present with a fever that cyclically rises and falls is in the case of an abscess. Now, if the lymphoma is left long enough, it may also progress to um, the liver or the spleen, and it can cause organomegaly of those regions. Finally, because we have um, white cells that may not function properly, and we have a low white cell count, it can increase the risk of infections. And also, if the lymphoma potentially spreads to the bone marrow, which is, the, of course, the production factory of red blood cells, then it may reduce the haemoglobin and therefore cause anemia. So the patient may find that they are getting tired more easily. Um, they may feel pale. Um, and again, this can cause shortness of breath as well. So let's think about the different subtypes of lymphoma in the case of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this might be important for um, treating a patient, for example. So the most common type of Hodgkin's lymphoma seen in the UK is nodular sclerosing. And again, in exam situations, typically they will, uh, they will tell you about this patient who has mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And so this is a key word to think about when it comes to the exams. Another type is mixed cellularity. Then we have lymphocyte predominant and lymphocyte depleted. Now, earlier I mentioned that it was important to subtype a patient's lymphoma because it may tell you how to treat them. And this is very true um, because it depends on the prognosis. So lymphocyte predominant lymphoma has the best prognosis, whereas lymphocyte depleted has the worst prognosis. 
and nodular sclerosing and mixed cellularity both considered to have a good prognosis. So it's not the best, but at the same time, it's not the worst. And now when it comes to investigations of Hodgkin's lymphoma, again, as we want, as we did uh, in the case, you want to start off by doing basic blood tests, assessing for um, the levels of white cells if the patient is anemic. Um, and then you also want to do a baseline kidney and liver function test. And this is important for two main reasons. First of all, if they are deranged, it may uh, suggest that the patient has um, metastatic disease. And secondly, because this is a lymphoma, the patient will likely require chemotherapy and other medication. And of course, you want to assess the baseline to see if their kidneys or their liver will be able to handle those medications. Additionally, you may want to carry out a blood film, and this will show you a leukoerythroblastic film. So, as you can imagine, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, we have white cells that are not adequately working, and the body is trying to replace those, and therefore the factory, in this case the bone marrow, is working overtime. And the, the same case here is with the anemia, so it's, it's, there, are, there isn't enough red blood cells. And so it's producing, it's trying to produce a lot of red blood cells as well. And so we have these red blood cells that are not formed properly and they may contain a nuclei and hence they're termed leukoerythroblastic film. Now you may also want to carry out a chest x-ray to investigate further with regards to the mediastinal lymphadenopathy because there is a number of reasons that a patient may have mediastinal lymphadenopathy, such as TB or sarcoidosis. And so you may want to examine the patient's chest to see if there's any uh, lung involvement. We also want to do a biopsy, and this is important because Hodgkin's lymphoma has a certain type of cell seen under the microscope, which you saw on the previous slide, uh, which is called a Reed-Sternberg cell. And so if these are present, then it suggests that the diagnosis is Hodgkin's lymphoma. We can also do a, a biopsy of the bone marrow um, to see how that process is working as well. Now, you also want to consider doing a CT or imaging tests. So first of all, typically you will consider doing CT thorax, abdomen and pelvis to look for any metastasis. If metastasis is seen, then it will be staged using a PET CT. And this brings me on to the next point, which is the Ann Arbor staging. Now this is a staging system used for both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And again, it will help to guide treatment and explain uh, to the doctor and the patient how severe the, the patient's um, lymphoma is. So if we start off with stage one, this is when the lymphoma is on a single site on one side of the diaphragm. And here you can see that the red line is illustrating the diaphragm. Stage two is more severe. So you have two or more sites, but they are still on the same side of the diaphragm. Stage three is where the disease is starting to spread on alternate sides of the diaphragm. And this could be one lymph node, it could be five lymph nodes. Um, but the point is that they are on both sides of the diaphragm. And then finally, for stage four, which is the worst prognosis, we have metastatic disease. So now it's spreading outside the lymphatic system into organs such as the uh, liver and also the bones might also be affected. Okay, so now let's think about the Hodgkin's lymphoma and how it might be treated. So the key principles to treating Hodgkin's lymphoma is chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And typically the regime used for Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, in the UK is ABVD. So this includes doxorubicin, bleomycin, vinblastine and docarbazine. Radiotherapy can again be used as an adjunct. And of course, it's, it's important to think about supportive care as well. So if the patient has a fever, they will need to be given antipyretics. Um, if they're vomiting, antiemetics. Um, if they have an infection, then of course that needs treatment with antibiotics. Okay, so now let's focus on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
and this typically occurs more in the older population, so it's unlikely to be seen in patients younger than 50. Secondly, it, again, it occurs in males more often, but with regard to the risk factors, this varies by the type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so I'll come on to that in a moment. Now, when it comes to the symptoms, again, the symptoms are typically uh, pretty similar. So again, you may have painless rubbery lymphadenopathy. However, the, the association with alcohol is um, not as commonly seen, if at all. However, you can also have the B symptoms, so the fever, night sweats, and weight loss. And there may also be organomegaly with anemia and low white cell counts. Now, the other thing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is that typically it, the spread is more random and it usually presents with more metastatic disease. So the patient may have um, abdominal symptoms, for example, if the GI system is impaired. So if the lymphoma is causing an obstruction, then it may cause abdominal pain. Um, the patient may not be going to the bathroom as often. And it can also cause chronic bleeding, which may lead to an iron deficiency anemia. So when you see an iron deficiency anemia, you're thinking a microcytic anemia. If the bone marrow is affected, this can again affect um, the production of uh, red blood cells, white cells, as well as platelets. And so you may develop a panocytopenia. And it can also affect the, the critical sites, such as the central nervous system, and so this may cause headaches and spinal cord compression symptoms, which would need urgent treatment. Now, again, when it comes to investigations, these are very similar. So you want to do a full blood count to look for any anemia or any white cell count, which is low. You want to do a baseline kidney and liver function tests. Again, a blood film may show a leukoerythroblastic film, and you can also conduct uh, biopsies, chest x-rays, and just like before, you want to stage the patient with the unarbor staging using um, CT and PET-CT. Okay, now when it comes to subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there are over 30 uh, odd. And I personally would not learn all of them, but there are a couple of important ones that you should know. Or you, uh, yeah. And essentially with the subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it helps to split them up into how severe they are. So indolent, aggressive, and highly aggressive or very aggressive. So let's have a look at an example of a indolent lymphoma. And the most common type here is follicular lymphoma. And in this type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we have a translocation between two chromosomes, which is 14 and 18. And because you have this translocation, it results in overexpression of the BCL2 gene. Now, this gene normally inhibits apoptosis. So thinking about it, it stops um, the cells from dying. So um, essentially what that means is that we have um, too much uh, inhibition of uh, the cells dying and therefore not enough cells are dying. So if there is a cell which has a mutation or um, cell injury, that cell may be allowed to continue to divide. And this is a problem because it means that the risk of developing lymphoma is greater. Now, when it comes to B cell versus T cell, in the case of follicular lymphoma, um, we have B cells that are commonly affected. Another example is marginal zone lymphoma, and again highlighted in red is a key exam point here, which is that it is associated with H. pylori. And this particular type of lymphoma uh, is going to affect the mucosa-associated uh, lymphoid tissue, which is what MALT stands for. And again, it's typically the B cells that are affected. Now let's have a look at an example of a aggressive lymphoma. And here we have diffuse B cell lymphoma. And of all of the lymphomas, whether they be indolent, aggressive or highly aggressive, diffuse B cell is the most common in the UK. And as the name suggests, it typically affects the B cells. 
And then we have very aggressive lymphomas. And in this case, the key example is Burkitt lymphoma. This is a lymphoma that occurs because of a chromosomal translocation between chromosome 8 and chromosome 14. And it causes overexpression of the MYC gene, which means that there is increased cell division and again increases the risk of lymphoma. Now, when it comes to the symptoms of Burkitt lymphoma, this is quite interesting because it will depend on the location. So for patients who are within Africa, it typically has a greater, um, the, the lymphoma will typically affect the jaw more often. And the role of EBV is, is quite high. So the t there appears to be a very high association to um, Burkitt lymphoma with Epstein-Barr virus for patients who are within Africa. This role is, or, or this association is much more weaker for patients who develop Burkitt lymphoma outside of Africa. Uh, additionally, they typically have more abdominal symptoms, so they may have abdominal pain um, and uh, rectal bleeding, constipation, etc. And typically, this lymphoma is found in immunocompromised patients, such as those with AIDS or HIV. And when you look under a microscope, then, um, uh, excuse the drawing, but you will see a starry sky appearance. And again, this is an important uh, point for the exams. Okay. And just to finish off, we have the T-cell lymphomas. And again, there are three key uh, ones to think about here. The first one is HTLV1 T-cell lymphoma. And this T-cell lymphoma is caused by the human uh, T-lymphotropic virus. Next, we have enteropathy T-cell lymphoma, and this is uh, associated with celiac disease. Finally, we have mycosis fungoides, and this characteristically involves the skin. And typically, patients may present with uh, discoid-shaped lesions, and um, here we, uh, it's it's quite specific to the mycosis fungoides. Okay, finally we'll talk about the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And just as before with Hodgkin's lymphoma, the uh, key mechanisms of treatment are chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So with, with chemotherapy, the, um, the agents used are slightly different compared to Hodgkin's lymphoma. So RCHOP or CHOP, uh, are the key um, chemotherapy agents used. So we have rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisolone. And again, you would consider radiotherapy if needed, and also supportive care. Okay, so um, thank you very much for watching the video. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe if you found it helpful, um, and please look out for our other videos as well. Uh, feel free to share the video if you think other people would uh, benefit from it as well. And if you have any questions, comments or general feedback, uh, then you can just pop that in the uh, comment section below. Thank you.